Good morning to all. I'm Lara Natale. It's my honor to facilitate this fireside chat session, deep diving into one of the key themes of this edition of the Forum Europe European Data Protection and Privacy Conference, which is bolstering the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR. This is a busy period in the data topics conference calendar in Europe, and this fireside chat will build on this, setting the scene for the great day ahead, building also on the thought-provoking keynotes we've just heard. If we think about the challenge Forum Europe has set for us, which our keynote speakers spoke to indeed, it's exploration of how trust in digital technologies within an increasingly data-driven society can be reignited, or the angle Kent Walker just introduced on how technology itself can help us to build trust. And the keynotes made clear that the GDPR uh, remains it remains, it continues to play the pivotal role in this, remains a benchmark for standard setting across the globe. But some three and a half years on from when GDPR became applicable, a solid 18 months since the formal two-year review, the tone has changed, as Paul Adamson said, and questions are asked as to how we can mitigate problems in the application and optimize what we get from this flagship European law. So the scope of this fireside chat will be open to covering the whole piece from practical application of the text to compliance and enforcement and the potential for changes in the direction of centralization, which Commission Vice President Jurova spoke to, and evolving jurisprudence such as the consequences of the Schrems II judgment, also referenced in the keynote addresses. We also have the GDPR context of data flows, transfer agreements, more EU rules under negotiation to build out the data a key, the DSA and the AI acts have been mentioned, for example, and the overall ambition to make Europe fit for the digital age. So we have three speakers at the very heart of the debate around this figurative fire of our web conferencing studio. We have Dr. Andrea Jelinek, Chair of the European Data Protection Board and Head of the Austrian Data Protection Authority. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We have MEP Juan Fernando Lopez Aguiar, Chair of the European Parliament's Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs Committee, known as LIBE. Good morning to you. Good morning. And good morning. And Matias Celarius, SAP's Global Data Protection Officer and Head of Data Protection at Privacy, also for SAP. Good morning, Matias. Good morning. Um, Good morning. So these speakers will provide remarks and conference delegates, your questions for speakers are welcomed. We have half an hour, not long, so I'll stop talking post haste. But if you can please post your questions in the chat, I will take them hoping time allows. Please mention also if your question is for a particular speaker. Now, um, I appreciate viewer participants are experts today, but in the event we go too heavy on Brussels related acronyms. Uh, and if anything is unclear, please also let me know and I'll seek to clarify promptly. Finally, it's time to really start. So, Dr. Andrea Jelinek, uh, welcome and good morning. Uh, you chair the EDPB now, and of course, you've headed up your National Data Protection Authority in Austria for just a month shy of eight years. And as such, you'll have seen the GDPR through its negotiation phase and all its life in force, let's say, to date. Uh, you've also been chair of the Article 29 Working Party since just before the GDPR entered into force. So can I ask then, what is your take on whether and how the GDPR can be bolstered and improved? And is there anything you can share with us on how the EDPB thinks about the one-stop shop uh, in terms of how it's working and what the EDPB might be doing to maximize the effectiveness of the GDPR? Andrea, over to you. Thanks and good morning to all of you. And I thank the organizers that we have the opportunity to have this conference uh, today, though to all these hurdles. Uh, I cannot more agree to what Vice President Jurova and the two uh, Minister of Justice from Slovenia and France just said before in the keynotes, the GDPR is our anchor and our cornerstone. Uh, and as uh, Vice President Jurova said uh, she encourages uh, regarding enforcement to take all the aspects into account. Yes, and we do this. Today we have more than 290 final decisions on cases in which the one-stop shop mechanism applied. So far, the majority of cases that were finalized have been resolved in the cooperation phase without the EDPP having to in intervene. The dispute resolution mechanism was triggered for the first time in the summer of 2020 and the board adopted its first 65 decision in November 
concerning Twitter, in July 2021, we adopted our second Article 65 decision regarding WhatsApp. And as Vice President Jourova and also the French minister already said, we have identified some challenges. Enforcing at the national level and at the same time resolving cross-border cases is time and resource intensive. Supervisory authorities need to carry out investigations, observe procedural rules, coordinate and share information with other supervisory authorities. For the current system to work properly, it is of vital importance that supervisory authorities have enough resources and staff. The differences in national administrative procedures and the fact that in some member states, no deadlines are foreseen for handling a case also creates an obstacle to the efficient functioning of the one-stop shop. Uh, but we took action and at the EDPP, we are implementing a series of practical solutions to remedy some of the problems we have identified. Already in October 2020, the EDPP developed a coordinated enforcement framework to facilitate joint actions in a flexible and coordinated manner, for example, to launch enforcement sweeps and joint investigations. We are also establishing a pilot project called the support pool of experts to provide expert support for investigations and enforcement activities of significant common interest. This will enhance the cooperation and solidarity between all the supervisory authorities by addressing their operational needs. That's what uh, also Vice President Jourova mentioned. She encouraged us to take all the aspects into account regarding enforcement, and this is what we do. Finally, we should not forget that the GDPR is a long-term project and so is strengthening cooperation between supervisory authorities. Any transformation of the GDPR would take years. I think the best solution is therefore to deploy the GDPR fully. It is likely that most of the issues identified by member states and stakeholders will benefit from more experience in the application of the regulation in the coming years. Thank you so much, Dr. Jelinek. And um, to an ending your note there on a call to really uh, implement and apply the GDPR as fully as we can and make the most of the text we have. So thank you very much. Um, we'll come to you uh, again after the rest of our speakers. So moving on to MEP Lopez Aguiar. Uh, good morning. You join us, of course, in your capacity as LIBE chair. And during your tenure, you've also been rapporteur or shadow rapporteur on a number of reports and opinions around exchange of data but you're also a prolific book writer uh, on legal and fundamental rights issues. So building on Dr. Yelinek's comments and appreciating that you bring us the political perspective in this fireside chat, is there political consensus emerging on whether there's any need to change the law itself? Uh, and how do you see the possibilities for improving and bolstering the GDPR as we have it now? Over to you. Well, first of all, Good morning again, Mrs. Natalia, and thank you for having me in this Data Protection and Privacy Conference. It's my privilege to represent here the Committee of Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, which you know it's the busiest committee in the House because it deals, among many other things, with legal developments concerning fundamental rights. And that's a perspective we have put right from the outset of the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty and the Charter of Fundamental Rights, including Articles 7, 8, and 47, which are of the essence to give perspective to the legal futures regarding data protection in a data-driven society from the European Parliament. Yes, we are in a data-driven society. I am a reader of Yuval Noah Hariri, which is uh, 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 well known as an author on the developments of algorithms bringing about real change, actually a revolution to human life in every possible perspective. But we must never overlook the importance of fundamental rights when facing this technological revolution. That, that's what we have done. We put in place the data protection package, the general data protection regulation, which is binding for the member states and the law enforcement directive. 
And then we have followed up all the way the implementation of this data protection package. We adopted in March 2021 a relevant European Parliament resolution regarding exactly the implementation of general data protection regulation two years after the final entry into force because the package was adopted in 2016 it entered into force 2018 by 2020 it was about time to see how it worked and the general assessment it was a success uh, of course there were so many prognoses that particularly small and medium enterprises would be in trouble and the general administration would also be in trouble to incorporate the new rules of the game but overall the implementation of the general data protection is deemed to be a success but of course there have been issues that have been brought to light and there is ground for improvement for sure regarding the legal basis for processing the rights of data subjects the situation of overall enforcement of data protection by data protection authorities the so-called dpas the national data protection authorities and of course the cooperation in cross-border cases but we focused particularly on the so-called one-stop shop mechanism because it, it's sure that there's need to speed up the ongoing investigation into major cases in order to show eu citizens that actually data protection is a, an enforceable right all across the European Union, including raising awareness. But we made a point of resources because it is a fact that data protection authorities need sufficient human, technical and financial resources. And it's not the case, particularly in certain jurisdictions, in certain member states. We, of course, we brought to light on the case of Luxembourg, we brought to light on the case of Ireland, we made a point on Ireland for good reason, because Ireland is the jurisdiction in which some major giants, technological giants in the net, are happen to be happen to be uh, located, and uh, we need to 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 bring to light the importance of securing proper resources in every possible way, and uh, in this resolution we adopted we ask the specific information to the European Data Protection Board and Supervisor and the data protection authorities on their resources as to the level of enforcement. By the end of July 2021, we have received a report from the European Data Protection Board, represented here by Dr. Jenelek, picturing the resources currently made available in each member state to the data protection authorities on the enforcement actions carried by the data protection authorities. But as to the future steps, how can we improve? We need to devote particular attention to the implementation and enforcement. Lessons learned. That's why we're planning to hold a hearing, a specific hearing that has been adopted by the coordinators of the committee I chair. And it's going to be taking place in, 21, in 2022. And as a general note, the data protection regulation continues to be a reference when assessing horizontal legislative proposals that are now underway within the European Parliament, particularly regarding the so-called artificial intelligence package, including the uh, 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 Digital uh, uh, Markets Act, the Digital Services Act, and the Digital Governance Act is a, is a package on digital governance which needs to be consistent with the data protection package which is already in place which is already effective which is legislated law and the 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 the, the emphasis that is putting the the committee of liberty justice and home affairs regarding this so-called digital and artificial intelligence package is precisely to make it consistent with general data protection regulation in order to protect the fundamental rights which are affected by artificial intelligence. I'm, I'm, I'm just making a summary because we could go into the detail because it's a real challenge. But to conclude, yes, it's been an overall success. It needs to be improved. Raising awareness about the rights of the citizens is of the essence. And we all have to be involved in that kind of a task both at EU and a national level, in order precisely to improve the delivery of the general data protection regulation. But let me assess simply 
as a conclusion that I am convinced that the data protection standards of the European Union happens to be the highest in the world. And that has created a variety of issues, challenges, and problems, including the transatlantic dialogue we hold with the United States, because it is a fact that because of that high standard of the European Union, the European Court of Justice has ruled that the level of protection, which has been uh, now in place in the United States, does not match the level of protection of the European Union, meaning that there have been a number of rulings that pose a legal challenge both to the Commission taking initiative and to the European Parliament in order to adopt the so-called safe harbor and privacy shield to the level of uh, uh, request and demand of the General Data Protection Regulation and the European Data Protection Laws. Thank you. Thank you, uh, MEP Lopez Aguiar. We also um, we note your positive assessment overall on GDPR implementation. You also outline the situation in specific jurisdictions as well, uh, and detailing the context indeed around the package of new legislation under consideration in Libya and how you're working to ensure coherence with the GDPR. It's clearly it will clearly be a busy time for the committee uh, in the coming months and, and years for the rest of the mandate. So thank you, uh, Matthias. Celarius, good morning. Um, you will bring us important views on the application of the GDPR as a representative of the leading European cloud and software company operating globally at large scale, uh, vast scale. And please share with us your take on the right balance on what's needed for the real economy and its users and any thoughts you might have based on experience say on supplementary private-public cooperation mechanisms, the cloud codes of conduct, for instance, and what we might learn from this method of cooperation uh, in terms of bolstering the GDPR. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, first of all, uh, for inviting me um, to speak here um, on behalf of, um, of basically the industry uh, stakeholders. And um, thank you also um, to my co-panelists. You've already touched on many, many things um, with respect to the GDPR. The success, the overall success that it's been um, overall, it's it's a role model law, um, not only um, in Europe, but also it's followed worldwide um, and it's created some sort of a standard. Um, and, but let me let me just focus now um, on those topics that are uh, important from my perspective um, as uh, a DPO in, um, in the industry. And um, what I see there um, in most cases is um, that um, businesses um, do not have any issues with applying the GDPR, uh, with implementing um, uh, rules um, and technologies to protect the fundamental rights of the people. The problem that um, many businesses face, and I, I would probably say it's um, uh, for the small and medium-sized enterprises, it's even uh, worse than for the big ones, is um, how to do that in a practical perspective. Um, people need a practical solution. Uh, we see from the GDPR um, a lot of um, bureaucracy, um, a lot of uncertainty also um, uh, with respect to how certain things should be applied. And um, people are looking for guidance on how to do that, how to, uh, for example, um, uh, um, abide by uh, the rules of the GDPR when it's in the context of new technologies. And um, um, I don't think that uh, we need to uh, crowd too much for uh, new legislative efforts. We have a great law here that we need uh, to apply um, uh, first and that we need to learn to apply and um, also um, where we need to have some conversations uh, with um, uh, um, co-stakeholders, uh, with the supervisory authorities, with political stakeholders, uh, things that we do here actually today in a conference like this, but also um, in working groups. And one of the things that's been a success um, in my view so far is um, the Cloud Code of Conduct, which is the first code of conduct in its kinds, uh, where um, actually there, there has been a collaboration between industry stakeholders um, and, um, and, and also policymakers, um, uh, as, as well as the regulators, in order to get some rules in place uh, that give a good guidance for the cloud industry um, on how to uh, comply with uh, the GDPR when, when offering their services, when creating them. Um, so um, this kind of collaboration is something um, um, that is extremely helpful in order to get to a safe environment, a safe environment for um, people, 
um, out there who are using the cloud services, but also safe environment uh, for the um, providers who are offering these cloud services and know how to do that. And then if we put a certification scheme on top of that, um, it's also um, um, something that um, is, is good in order not only to prove um, that you are compliant with a certain law, but also to give some certainty um, to your business, to investors and everyone, everyone out there to, to demonstrate uh, that uh, you are doing the right thing. Um, and this is even more important, um, the more we move into a data-driven society, um, the more um, we look for new technologies. Um, uh, when we look at international collaboration, it's also a very important aspect. Um, it was already mentioned um, this morning uh, that uh, due to the high standards that we have here in Europe, um, we do have an issue of international business models uh, where we don't um, see um, in other countries the same level of protection. But um, I mean, what should the solution be? To isolate Europe? No, probably not. We need to seek a collaboration. We need some guidance. We need things in place that also others outside see um, that um, what we do here can be implemented in a, in a proper way. Um, and it, it is practical and that business models can be, in, um, can be insured. Protecting the rights of the individuals alone will not help if we cut off everyone from technologies that everyone um, just from a practical aspect is just using. So rather let's work on something um, that uh, on the practical implementation of the GDPR and the practical interpretation uh, that, um, uh, that, that, that allows everyone to offer and use um, uh, the, uh, the new digital services and, and uh, data insights um, in, in a proper way. Um, yeah, I think that's enough for the beginning. And with that, thank you. And um, I would hand back to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Matthias. And uh, yes, the cloud code of conduct is clearly um, sort of set the standard that can be uh, applied ongoingly uh, in terms of other codes of conduct or guidelines. And, and, and it's interesting to learn from that industry collaboration too. Right, um, we have time uh, possibly for one set of questions. So I'll read out the ones I have. And Dr. Jelinek, I think I'll come to you first on this one and then to the other speakers, if that's all right. So Lind Lindsay Hendricks from Deloitte has a two-part question. Um, one is, what can concretely be done to address the inconsistent application and enforcement of the GDPR across member states? And part two of that would be, how can further cooperation between data protection authorities be encouraged to strengthen the consistency mechanism and support cross-border investigations? Dr. Jelinek, I'll come to you first. Thanks, Lara, for, uh, for this question uh, that you forwarded to me just now. Uh, I think to foster cooperation even more, we have the opportunity, and we do it, uh, to work on a daily basis on our cross-border cases. Uh, all in all, we have nearly 2,000 cross-border cases uh, we are working on on a daily basis to cooperate from uh, one supervisor authority with the other. That's the one issue. The second issue is uh, the more cross-border co cases are decided, the more consistent application of the GDPR will be there because the decision in these cross-border cases is not only uh, valid for the country uh, in which the decision was taken, it's valid all over the European economic area. So I think it's it's really, uh, as uh, our Vice President Jureva said, uh, the cornerstone and also as uh, as um, Juan said, uh, it is we are here to improve the delivery and as I already said before, we are, we are taking up action even more uh, than it is foreseen on practical solutions to uh, foster practical solutions like the coordinated enforcement framework or the, uh, the establishment of the support pool of experts. And I'm also really grateful that if, if I may, to react on what Matthias Celario said regarding uh, interactions of the EDPB with stakeholders. Uh, we are well aware of the importance of interacting with stakeholders on a regular basis, and we do it. And stakeholders are not only private companies, but also NGOs, academic institutions, and the governmental organizations. And we do it via our uh, stakeholder events, but also uh, all our, nearly all our adopted guidelines 
are then submitted to public consultations. To some guidance documents, we get as many as 200 replies of companies and NGOs and academic institutions. Uh, and we are analyzing all these uh, documents in detail in order to address any gaps in our uh, documents that might still exist in our draft guidance. And in the context of our annual report, we are also question stakeholders on the quality of our guidance through an online survey. And we have an intensive year long program for taking part in conference and events like this. And we are eager to engage with the stakeholders. I know uh, in the in our digital world, it's not so easy uh, to come together like in person and to chat around the couloirs. But if we still keep on speaking, it will improve any day. And I'm happy that uh, the that all the other speakers also said uh, that the GDPR is a role model law, not only for Europe, but sets the pace in the whole world. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Jelinek. And, and clearly the range of activity from the EDPB and gathering input is, is very clear. Thank you for outlining that for us further. Uh, MEP Lopez Aguiar, I don't know if you'd have any views on this question, but also as we're nearing close, if you have any uh, remarks you'd like to make based on what you heard from other speakers, please do take the opportunity as well. Thank you. I thank you again. And of course, let me remind you that the European Parliament is a political body. It's a lawmaking body, but it's a political body. Actually, it's the only one democratically elected institution in the European architecture. And we will give, we will, we will give account of our responsibility towards the citizens' rights. Once we have legislated in a matter, what we can do is organize hearings to request all of the institutions to do their role, particularly making the Commission accountable as guardian of the treaties and the EU law of how EU law is actually implemented. And in case, request the Commission to set in motion infringement procedures to those member states which are failing to comply with EU law. That is the, that is the general approach, the general analysis. And we have done that, actually, not only when adopting a resolution, but when we have put in place specific hearings as to how the General Data Protection Regulation and the law enforcement directive have been implemented the general the, the, the data protection package we assess having heard from experts and and uh, the european data protection supervisor and the european data protection board andrea jelinek knows only too well that she's been there in the podium of the libe committee a number of times and we have heard carefully about the reports of the implementation and the enforcement of the general data protection regulation the possible shortcomings that have been identified the causes of disparities in the implementation across the member states what is the role which is to be played by data protection authorities the national data protection authorities which are to be held accountable also for the proper implementation of the rulings of the general data protection package to hear from them, from data protection authorities, as to the resources, which I have stressed, resources are of the essence. And they have to actually deliver in uh, fulfilling their role in, in making sure that data protection standards are respected in all of the member states. And we also have heard from citizens and NGOs. They have been relevant individuals for good reason, invited to the podium of the Libre Committee as to their testimony as to what happens in certain jurisdictions, in certain member states, in full compliance or not of the data protection standards. We have heard, from instance, Max Rems himself and his NGO, none of your business. We have heard the narrative of the cases that have been brought to the European Court of Justice. Schrems won. 200, uh, 2015, SREMS 2, 2020. Those are relevant cases identifying the lack of compliance as to the data protection standards of the transatlantic relation we hold with the United States in both of its formats, thus posing a big challenge to the European Commission to update the, 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 the legal framework as to our transfer of data to the United States and back 
so our bilateral dialogue on the matter. And besides that, we are to discuss, of course, possible ways of improving the data protection regulation if needed. We have not identified a, 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 an immediate need to lower the standard. There have been voices within the European Parliament advocating for that, reviewing the general data protection standard, but they have not summed up the majority, not by now. So we are ready to, 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 to discuss how to improve, if needed, the general data protection regulation. That's what we do as, as, as to the follow-up of our standards. But I insist, it is obvious that the general data protection uh, uh, laws in, uh, at, at European level are the highest in the world, the most demanding in the world. We are actually, as it's been said, we're, we're, we are setting the standard, we're setting the pace. And if we are to hold bilateral relations of transfer of data, notably with the United States, we have to be highly demanding as to protecting our standards, not to lowering them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aripi Lopez, and clear messages to there on accountability, the global standard setting, and making sure we don't compromise by lowering that standard. So thank you very much. Matthias, if I could come to you for a quick concluding remark uh, before it's time to close, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, and um, thank you for this great session, first of all, and uh, thanks also for the good moderation, Lara. Um, so um, I'm, I'm very pleased that I heard basically from my two co-panelists um, that there is an open dialogue, um, and that we um, that we that we all realize that if we want to improve um, on um, uh, on the GDPR, uh, the, um, it, it's, it it only works by basically bringing all the stakeholders together and have um, um, some sort of uh, good exchange. I'm just calling out for a more intensive um, exchange, less formal. And basically also to have round tables where we have all stakeholders together. If we can show to the world how we practically apply the GDPR, that business can work, that um, individual rights um, are uh, properly protected, um, that we have a society that's modern, that's working um, in, in a digital way, and yet at the same time um, respects the right of the citizens. If we can show that, we can only do that together by bringing everyone to the table then we really set the role model for the world. And maybe um, uh, it's, this role model will be adopted uh, more and more. And that's my sincere hope. And that's also my offer um, uh, to basically be ready for this kind of a discussion um, outside the formal kind of consultation, but rather being in a way that we have a round table uh, with all the stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthias. And to your point of bringing everyone around the table, I think Forum Europe have done a fantastic job in always in convening this big conference with participants from across the world, as I can see from the delegate list. So thank you so much again uh, to our three distinguished panelists, Matthias Celarius, MEP Lopez Aguiar, and Dr. Jelinek for taking the time to share your expertise, covering so many aspects of how the GDPR is working and how we might take it forward while keeping the global standard that Europe has set. Very many thanks again to Forum Europe for their reliable logistical support, which enabled our viewer participants to interact with our panelists. We will now close this fireside chat and take a break, uh, returning, I think, still at 10.45 a.m. CET for session one, which is exploring the intersection of data privacy and competition in the platform economy. Uh, it's been my pleasure to join. So thank you very much again and wishing you a nice coffee break. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Natalie. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you bye. so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.